Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar, Five Steps to Future-Proof Your Business Analysis Career. I'm your host, Mariah Weiss, and I work as part of the marketing team here at IABA. IABA is an independent, not-for-profit professional association serving the global business analysis community. A recognized thought leader, IABA is dedicated to elevating the discipline of business analysis. We provide our global community with relevant tools, resources, and networking opportunities to support their career development and success. I'm here with our panelists, Kate Murray, Erica Woods, and Danelle Casera. Director of PMO Solutions, Kate Murray, PMP and CSM certified, manages the talent acquisition strategies of the Apex Systems PMO and Business Analysis Practice, including leading the efforts for supporting the needs of their clients' PMOs. I'm also here with Erica Woods, Erica is the Director of IT Contractor Programs and Philanthropy at Apex Systems, encompassing their hashtag Apex Gives Back campaigns and involvement in various STEM programs. Our third panelist is Danelka Serra. Danelka is the Chapter Operations Manager here at IIBA. With over 15 years of experience in a variety of sectors as a business analyst, uh, she develops relationships, discovers solutions, and drives value as her main motivators. Today, our panelists will discuss with you five steps to future-proof your business analysis career. These steps can help you adapt to the current situation while advancing your, your career despite our uncertain times. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the questions tab in your control panel. We will answer some of your questions at the end of the session as time permits. You can find today's deck in the handouts tab. Today's webinar recording will be available in our IIB webinar archives page within seven business days of broadcast. And without further ado, I'll hand this presentation off to Kate and Erica. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having us. Kate and I have had the opportunity to present at a lot of IIBA chapter um, meetings in the States, uh, speak at BA World Conferences, and we've met a lot of folks in the IIBA community, which is always wonderful. And this is our first opportunity to speak on a global IIBA um, kind of platform. Really excited to share our tips today in five crucial areas that can help grow your skills and have an insane positive impact on your brand, um, strengthen your network, and a couple other things. So we're excited to share just kind of how we got started in these areas, the benefits that we've seen, and some very specific tips for how to get you started. Um, and we're going to focus on advice that helps from both an internal standpoint and external. So not only the things you can be doing within your company to, again, develop those skills, uh, grow your brand, which is so important when it comes to future-proofing your career, um, but also what can you be doing more of within your external communities um, in these areas. So let's start it off with a poll. And, you know, we're excited to share our advice, but it's always really cool for us to see, you know, what are you most excited to learn about? So I'm going to launch this poll. And just which areas are you most interested in learning about? Oh, I love this. <laughs> yeah. This is great. And we just did this poll for the first time at within another community a month ago. And it's so interesting to see the results. They shocked us the first time. Now I'm less shocked because they're mirroring. <laughs> so I'm gonna go ahead and close and share the results. And again, this is really helpful to see. And so um, number one, by a landslide, 86%, how can you identify the trends and skills in demand, which is so crucial for your career, because where should you be spending and focusing your time? Um, so we're going to start, it wasn't intentional, but we're going to start with that as our number one. 
Yeah. Oh gosh, it keeps going back to this. Sorry, everybody. All right, great. So our first recommendation is to identify trends within your space. And this may seem obvious to many of you, but from our perspective, this is a question that we get from prospective candidates or job seekers on a regular basis. What is trending in my space? How do I break it down? Maybe you saw a job description that listed five technologies you're unfamiliar with. How do you decide which one is important to focus on? Understanding trends and building a training plan around those trends has a positive impact in so many ways. It can improve your marketability um, as a candidate, uh, differentiate you, help your overall brand, your resume, and your overall confidence. So today I'm going to look at trends in two parts. I'm going to share our internal data on what is trending and then focus on tips and tricks for determining and staying on top of those trends. So I oversee our PMO and business operations area for Apex as a whole. And a large part of my job is talking with our clients across our national account portfolio regarding their current or upcoming openings. So I look at a lot of job descriptions and I have a lot of conversations with hiring managers on a weekly basis. And to give you some perspective on average, we place about 1500 business analysts on a yearly basis. And in my conversations with customers over the last year, three things have really stuck out. Um, the first is they want candidates that have experience working in an agile environment or with a scrum team. Second, which kind of goes very closely to that, is they want somebody that is strong and has experience writing epics, features, user stories, and defining acceptance criteria. And the third, which I really think that the space between, you know, data analysis and business analysis is, you know, kind of merging, is that data analysis experience. So whether that's advanced uh, Excel skills, I hear a lot from clients, they want somebody that, that can do the lookups in their sleep, a SQL writing queries or creating store procedures, or even developing dashboards and Tableau or similar tool. So I was curious as to our data on these three areas that I'm always hearing clients talk about. So I ran the numbers and it was actually quite interesting. So I wanted to share it on this webinar. So year over year, um, and again, these are requests from our personal customer base. We saw a 14% increase in requests um, for business analysts with agile, scrum or Kanban or safe experience. Excel was pretty flat, uh, about 1% up year over year, which I thought was, you know, pretty typical. SQL was up 5%. Tableau was up 55%, which I found very interesting. Um, user stories, just the mention of user stories in a job description, there was a 20% increase and a 24% increase with the words acceptance criteria. So again, I thought this was very interesting and I wanted to share it on this platform. Again, keep in mind that those trends are relative to Apex and our customer base. So how do you go about determining the top skills and technologies in demand where you live or in your skill set? So you really can learn uh, current trends through a variety of sources. I think recruiters are a great tool that are often overlooked. Find a few trusted recruiters that support your skill set. That's a key factor in this. And ask them, what are the top one to two skills or technologies clients are requesting for business analysts lately? Easy enough. Another thing you can do, pay attention to the topics being presented at your local meetups, user groups, um, other technical community events. Um, uh, of course, you're here with, with us at IIBA, um, and they have a lot of great content around this. Um, so another great place to look. Uh, reading technology news, articles, listening to tech podcasts, uh, you know, reading the annual trends report such as ThoughtWorks. We included the link to the DICE Tech Trends Report, uh, which we really love. Um, that's a yearly report that I love looking at. Um, another, great, another great avenue is asking members of your local community, especially those that have recently gone through a job search or their similar career path as yours. Uh, and another great avenue is signing up for job alerts. A lot of people don't think about this, but you can spend 10 to 15 minutes a month reviewing the technologies listed as required or preferred pluses and writing down any technologies that are repeatedly listed. Again, you're looking for trends there. What are the things that are coming up the most? Erica, anything else that you want to mention on trends? I think the biggest thing to me is 
you know, within your meetup community and your IBA community, think about all of the, the sponsors of your groups, right? In all the communities I've ever lived, it's at least half of the folks sponsoring you or attending, you have a representative from a staffing firm. Usually that representative is the person hiring for that skill set within their market. So take that extra time to crowdsource and, and pose questions to them and say something along the lines of, you know, I'd love more insights on what's kind of trending and what companies are asking for and using. What's the number one skill that you're seeing that your clients are requesting that's been an uptick over the last six to 12 months? Mm -hmm. That is the number one thing. Just think about the folks involved in your group that you can pose that and then pose it in a way that their knowledge is shared with your whole community. Perfect. Let's go on because this feeds right into our second recommendation. Yeah, so a crucial first step with future-proofing your career is again, understanding what should I be learning? What skills should I be building? And step two is just one, how can I start building those skills and training is a huge area. Uh, one of my favorite things to do at Apex as part of my role is I do our interviews with our consultant spotlights. So anytime one of our clients is like, I have a rock star on my team, how do I get them recognition within the, the larger Apex community? This person is just a complete rock star. And over the, the 25 to 30 interviews I've done with these folks, one of the things I always hear, it's echoed on every conversation, is I never stop learning. And they always do a variety of things to be developing their knowledge. Um, so I'm going to share some of the, the favorite examples I've heard over the years. And I also think it's important to note that this is a shared responsibility um, amongst yourself, amongst your leadership team at work and your company but also you know, within your community creating training opportunities. I also think it's really important that if you're not getting what you need, that you have to be vocal from a training standpoint. Um, so doing kind of a, a quick pulse check once a quarter, or every six months, and what's the number one thing I need to be successful in my role? A lot of the time that might be training in a specific area. Um, but with those in mind, you know, there's lots of things you can do. There's uh, training within your organization. You know, at Apex, we've got at least eight different development programs, um, two of which I wasn't familiar with until I consulted. So ask yourself, have I really visited, you know, my internet internally? Have I talked to somebody from my training and development team? Just simply put, am I aware of everything that exists at my organization? And I'd be shocked if there wasn't something that you weren't already utilizing. Um, then take that second step to share it. If you learn a resource or a program internally, right, at your organization or within your community, share that with your team. Go the, hey, did you know route? Here's what I learned. Um, so really take that time to create a culture of learning within your organization. Um, create your own club. When I was talking to one of our ERP consultants, this was maybe eight months ago at this point, um, you know, he shared how eight folks that were part of his initial program in school, they link up at one Saturday a month for two hours. They've done this now for years and they just share, hey, what are you you're working on? What have you learned? Are you attending any upcoming conferences? Is there a specific question or challenge that you're running into that you're struggling with? And just kind of other advice. Right. I'm currently part of a public speaking club with one of our partners at CompTIA because that's an area that I want to improve upon myself. Right. One of the local uh, coding students I just had a conversation with last week, he's created a 12 week soft skills club for folks that are graduating from the programming school. So, again, think through what exists. Right do some research, but also if there isn't something conducive to the skill or area you want to increase, make sure you're taking that time to, to flush something out because that can be so instrumental with your career as well. That's one of the biggest areas that helped with my internal kind of track and promotions is I saw a need early on. I kind of built out a training program at a local level that then went regional and then national. Um, 
And then there's so many different things external. I think the last major point I want to make on training and development is you're probably aware of all of the, hopefully you're aware of all of the resources that exist in your main community, but look outside your main community. So I'm going to give one example. Kate referenced the growth in SQL as well as Tableau. Almost every community has what's called a SQL Saturday. They have SQL server meetup groups. Right. So in addition to attending things like IIBA, you know, have you done some prospecting on Meetup or other platforms to identify what else exists locally? And then attending something like an annual SQL Saturday is so huge. Kate, I know you're really passionate about the training and development piece. What else would you say here? Yeah, so I, I think there are two pieces that I want to point out. You know, first of all, it doesn't, as Erica mentioned, it doesn't have to be a formal training program that your company has. You know, continuous education can really be a variety of things. And there are so many free resources out there, especially now. A lot of companies that were, you know, charging for things pre-COVID, a lot of their resources are free or at a deep discount now. So I think nowadays I've seen more people get certifications or take training or do these things, you know, maybe because we have a little bit more time, but also, um, you know, there is a, a nice little cost break there. Um, and the other thing is with training and development, you know, it can seem really, it can seem really big, right? And really like, how am I going to do this? But just starting small, two to four hours a month, you know, committing to, hey, this is what my training plan is, and I'm going to commit, you know, one hour a week, one hour every two weeks, whatever it is, really, really can make an impact. Um, you know, Eric and I, again, we have a lot of experience working with hiring managers, and that continuous education piece is truly what sets candidates apart. I mean, we have had candidates get the job simply because they looked up a tutorial on something or researched a concept that was found in a job description. So this is a this is an avenue that you never want to underestimate because it really can help with your overall candidate marketability and, and differentiate you. Yeah. And one of the, th the things to ask yourself is the, the what else, right? Outside of the office, what am I doing? And to Kate's point, making sure that that stuff, because it is a massive, what we call candidate differentiator, and it gives you a candidate advantage with internal promotions, anytime you embark upon a job search. And once you do complete that stuff, make sure it's represented on your LinkedIn profile and on your resume, because you can add an additional courses section. Um, one of the things I've you know, loved seeing over the last couple months is the amount of uh, free material or, you know, resources that have been made free. So the one I want to point out that's at the bottom of the slide, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Pluralsight, but Pluralsight back in April made the decision to host any virtual conference material for free on their website. So while that platform usually has a cost component each month, you can access an insane amount of incredible content um, through that link at the bottom. Um, so, and, you know, I'd encourage you this chat question. We don't have time or the bandwidth to go through this with everyone, but this is something spark it within your next, you know, IBA community virtual event or meetup, you know, talk through these topics, identify someone in your community who has a shared goal. And to Kate's point, just, a monthly coffee or chat about it, and that'll hold some accountability as well as drive more ideas as well. Love it. All right, so let's move into our next topic, which is thought leadership. So we're going to start with writing, and I, I always just smile at this topic because never in my life did I think I'd be a writer, never considered writing. English was my least favorite subject in school by far. Um, and even to go a step further, I was a math and economics major. So data and numbers are my language. But that being said, I found myself really given the nature of the work that I've been in, I've been with Apex for 15 years, I found myself interested in providing advice around career services related topics, whether that's interviewing tips, how to work effectively with recruiters, resume advice, search strategies. And I just started writing about those things. And between the two of us, we've written well over 100 articles and blog posts. 
And one thing that we like to point out is we're happy to report that only one of those um, articles received criticism. So I honestly think that's a pretty good ratio and I think we're pretty proud of that. Um, but the reality is when you put content out there, people are gonna have feedback. People always have feedback as we know. Uh, hopefully for the most part, it will be positive and constructive, but accept that criticism is inevitable and it can be a really great learning experience. Now, if you're on this webinar and you're thinking, I'm not a writer and you're asking yourself, do I even have content that people would be interested in? And what would I even share? Where would I start? I promise you that you do have content. Think through these things that you're interested in. What are you passionate about? You could start with something as simple as publishing a LinkedIn post, summarizing what we talked about on this webinar today, or another webinar you listened to, a podcast you listened to, an article you read. There are some really great options out there, but I really think the hardest part with writing is simply starting and having the confidence to do so. And keep in mind that writing and sharing content, again, it goes back to that candidate differentiator, is a great way to distinguish yourself from other candidates. Eric, anything on the writing topic? I mean, one of your goals should be to think about, you know, as you're building your network, both internally at your company and externally, and then get, you know, growing your LinkedIn connections, is how can I kind of position myself and brand myself as a thought leader? And so you odds are, especially if you're attending, you know, something like this webinar, is that you're very in tune just with best practices. Um, but are you taking that extra step to, to then share that, right? So as you read an article, as you take a training, as you attend an IIBA event, right and it's especially if it's recorded afterwards and, and displayed take it a step further by saying you know sharing what you got out of it right that's something so small that you can do it'll take one or two minutes um and kind of set you up for that and then i think i think my other big thing about writing and this is how kate and i both started writing and i think this is a funny story to share uh we both write for ms sql tips which is an online technology community um, it took me a year to agree to write because I knew that I wasn't ready for that criticism. And to Kate's point, you have to be able to, you know, maybe not embrace, but accept the fact that it's going to happen. It is absolutely inevitable that that criticism will arise. But what we started writing about and what it took me a year to agree to was just a series of articles on how to write or how to work effectively with recruiters. And that's how it all started. And so now as I look back, 90% of what we have written stems from pain points we've heard from people. So mm -hmm. I would apply that same logic if this is an area that you wanna start creating content and you can do this internally, right? Does your internal organization feature articles? Do they have a newsletter, right? Could you just write an article and post it in a, in a Teams channel or a Slack? group, right? There's no shortage of ways to get your content out there. But think about what advice am I constantly giving? And that also helps ensure you're writing about something you're passionate about, which is also very helpful. So the other bucket of thought leadership, and again, this can be internal at your organization as well as external, is kind of the, the presenting, going that public speaking route and this is probably not even probably this is 100 percent the area that has been the biggest challenge over my last 10 years and kate has seen that firsthand when i first started my professional career um, back in 2005 um i couldn't i couldn't public speak at all i would it would completely be debilitating for me i would get derailed um i wouldn't even remember what i said i would visibly shake it was a challenge, but for what I wanted to do in my career and also what I wanted to do within the community world, because I'm a I actively volunteer with a couple big kind of nonprofit initiatives, is I had to, to get over that fear of public speaking. And um, anytime you can make yourself more visible within your company, within your community, which public speaking is a great, great way to achieve that that's one of the top ways you can, again, position yourself as a thought leader 
impact your brand, grow your network, get people thinking about you, and then it's so much easier uh, to be put in consideration. So however you want to you know, start, um, some recommendations we have, start small, but start. Mm -hmm. I love that little image. You know, I started at the local SQL Server user group when I lived in Baltimore. Um, I also grabbed a buddy. I found one of the biggest things that worked for me was having someone like Kate. I initially co-presented um, with one of the managers in the office at the time, Vivek, and that helped tremendously with just the confidence piece, the content, and making sure I was sharing things that were valuable. Um, that helped also overcome my imposter syndrome, et cetera. Some of the other things that that worked for me, and I'm sure you guys are like, why is there a treadmill on this page? Figure out a prep routine that works for you. That has been probably one of the most instrumental things that I've done to help with kind of the public speaking and the nerves and the preparation piece. And what Kate and I do, we used to travel all the time, you know, but now we're doing things virtually, is we would get on the treadmill and just talk through our content um, together. What stories do we want to share? What are the main tips we want to get across, right? So having a prep routine that helps you, you know, just prepare the material while also getting rid of some of those um, excess energy is really, really helpful. And then with the push-ups, tried and true, I do this, I did this before I started this presentation. That's something that worked for me, just doing 15 to 20 push-ups before I get rolling. Mm -hmm. um, the last big tip I have with public speaking is think about who in your network is really good at it and just treat them like an informal mentor or coach. Ask for 10 to 15 minutes of their time. And, you know, hey, Kate, I admire, you know, whenever you give a presentation, it's always really captivating. You don't seem nervous. Can I pick your brain for 10 minutes? Did, did it start that way? Or did you have nerves early on? And which I found over 90% of people, it wasn't natural. Um, but just what tips do you have? You know, some of the best advice I got was I took three people who I admired from a public speaking standpoint, and I just picked their brain. And I learned a ton of amazing information that helped kind of set me up. Anything else that helped you, Kate, kind of get over those nerves, just start putting yourself out there? Yeah, and I, for me personally, my journey was a little bit different in public speaking. So I actually started with Toastmasters. And at the time I was managing a group of recruiters and one of the gentlemen, it was part of his training plan was more effective communication. There was a local to Toastmasters that met at lunchtime and I said, hey, let's go do this together, you know, because I really wanted him to feel that I was supporting him. And it also would be a really great experience for me. So I found Toastmasters was a really great place to start because it's a no judgment zone. Everybody's so supportive. It's a small group. So if that's something, you know, that would be a great avenue to look at um, for those of you who are looking to get started. And then from there, I actually spoke with my boss. Um, I live in Ohio and I spoke with my boss at uh, Ohio University to a group of graduating sales professionals, really about um, our industry and what we do, you know, and, and that sort of thing. And again, it's something I'm really familiar with. So, you know, start in a comfortable, you know, maybe small group environment. And then also start with something that you are really comfortable with, passionate about interested in because that's going to be easier for you to talk about and be more comfortable with yeah <laughs> that, leads, that leads us into kind of our, our next slide is just where else can you start which is probably the biggest question that i get just you know different platforms um where you can look so i mean obviously within kind of iiba or you know other associations within your area um again i'm going to drop the look at other meetups route Right. So in, I'm based in Tampa Bay area now. I came from the Baltimore, D.C. Uh, area, and there's probably over 50 different meetups within both communities. But just like every meetup, they're looking for speakers. Right. So even if it's not within your wheelhouse exactly, you can go connect with, you know, an organizer of another tech meetup and say, hey, you know, this is what I do for work. Would you be interested in lining up a topic on, you know, a crash course on effective requirements gathering techniques, 
right? How to manage stakeholder expectations. There's so many topics that, you know, IBA folks are excellent at that would benefit every, everyone, every profession. So you really do actually bring a unique value proposition to the table with other communities, which you might not realize. So again, I'd encourage you to, to step one, identify other communities out there, right? And then just what can I do to contribute if this is an area that you want to look at? Um, also, if you have, you know, kids, the middle high school, there's so many STEM programs. Two weeks ago, I actually co-presented um, a session for a group of middle school uh, girls through Code for Virginia on just my surprising career journey into technology. Um, so there's just so many different platforms um, out there that you can kind of present at. Uh, so definitely kind of pay attention um, to those. And one of our resources that I, I wanted to drop in, um, we did a panel discussion for our company that um, I helped set up called Find Your Voice with three experts, including a TEDx speaker. They shared some really, really powerful tips and their stories um, on just how they got started. And, you know, they had shared, gosh, over 20 different uh, recommendations for really how to put yourself out there. Um, from giving presentations, but also the last 20 minutes was uh, networking related tips. So definitely encourage you to kind of check out um, that resource if this is an area again that you really want to learn more about. Yeah, and I'd love to, um, you know, in the question box, you know, as we as we're going through this slide and, and kind of wrapping up this thought leadership topic, I'd love to know for any writers or speakers out there, what's your what's your top tip for getting started? You know, overcoming nerves, or how do you come up with topics? So, you know, if you guys want to, if anybody that's in that group of writers and speakers and wants to share that, I think that can be really helpful for the group. Um, but now that Erica has shared how and where to start your journey, let's discuss some concrete steps we're getting started. So like I mentioned before, ask yourself, what can I write or speak about? What am I passionate about? What are my interests? Are, are there any topics I consider myself a SME in? Um, and on the same side, where can I actually speak? What groups am I a part of that I could speak at? Your IIBA community is a great place to start, but there may also be some great outside avenues as well. You know, and Erica mentioned some of them, but a crash course on business analysis at a local code camp, talking to a college or university about a career as a business analyst, on LinkedIn, recapping meetings, webinars, articles you've read, and what stuck out to you. You know, that is a great place to just to just start, you know, I think a lot of people get their start on LinkedIn and really make a name for themselves. And then where are you sharing this content? Again, I think a lot of people start on LinkedIn, maybe they expand to Twitter, other platforms, but are there other websites, you know, and platforms that could benefit from your message? I know so many people that have started LinkedIn groups uh, to share best practices, content, you know, documents, things like that. And think of how awesome something like that would look to a potential employer that you started a group. I mean, that, that's just, that's such a win-win. And if this truly is an area that you want to focus on, identify one smart goal around positioning yourself as a thought leader. Again, add that to your training plan, that two to four hours a month that you're going to spend and really commit to it. Um, but, you know, I think the options here really are endless. And it's, it's a matter of getting started, creating content, sharing content, and really committing to it. Was there anything that popped up in the, in the chat or questions, Erica, that we should call out? So I do kind of want to address now this question that came up about the trends piece. Um, oh, okay. In your opinion, is there a future or emerging current need for cybersecurity business analysis skills? Because um, we didn't hit on that, but 100% there is. So thank you yes. for bringing that up. Kate, do you want to take that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, which is interesting. That's a great question. Um, so we work with Talent Neuron, um, which we used to be wanted analytics for those of you that are familiar. Um, but that was one of the big trends that they actually put, called out for business analysis, um, specifically with cybersecurity. I personally haven't seen a trend in it yet. But, um, you know, in the sense of like numbers going up dramatically, but we are starting to see 
um, customers ask for that type of experience. And again, it might just be experience working with a cybersecurity team on a cybersecurity initiative. Uh, but I think that is absolutely anything data and anything security related. I always recommend folks to go down that path. Yeah, and it was on the slide, but we didn't call it out. Um, again, lots of great free resources. Um, there's probably you know, two or three different cybersecurity related organizations or meetup groups or associations within your area. Um, B sides is a kind of like uh, IIBA does professional development days. B sides mm -hmm. is the version of the cybersecurity conference that happens once a year. Um, in most communities, there's some B sides conference content that you can access via that plural site conference material. And then Cybrary is a really great online resource. A lot of their content is free to help you develop that introductory cybersecurity. Absolutely. Thank you for that question, though. That's great. Now, let's move on to mentorship. And I know Danelkis is going to talk a little bit about this in regards to IABA late, uh, later. But whether you are a mentee or a mentor, mentorship is a great career development strategy. And really think of all the advantages. So if you're someone looking to move into a more senior role or a leadership role, and you've mentored multiple people that have gone on to be successful, that looks fantastic from an outside perspective that you're ready to lead and coach a group of people. And on the flip side, if you're someone that's just getting started or looking to gain experience in a new area and you seek out a mentor and work with them over time to hone your skills, what does that show about your overall initiative? I mean, those are, again, fantastic things. This is what employers look for. Um, and I think we actually have a poll here. So, Erica, if you want to fire that one up. Um, but another thing I want to emphasize here is you don't need to have a formal mentor or be a part of an official mentorship program. Simply finding a coach that you can observe and ask questions about a certain technology skill is a great start. And, you know, of course, we're in a time where the majority of us are remote, but luckily we have all these tools, you know, Zoom, go, go to meeting, WebEx Teams. You can set up a working session with a mentor or mentee and kind of continue down this path. But I think this is one of the most overlooked areas that really can help advance your career. So I just launched the poll. Oh, thank you so much. We'll give you a few seconds for that. I love watching these poll results come in. It's so fun. Yeah. And we have a recommended resource on this topic too. Um, Dr. Paul Shem, he's done a few um, webinars for us. Really fantastic. This mentoring one, you know, if you're looking um, for, you know, how do I go about this? How do I be a good mentor? This is an awesome webinar that I would highly, highly recommend. And yeah, it does look like most people have mentored via work, which makes sense. Again, if you know somebody, though, you know, in an organization, a user group that you're in, a meetup that you really are interested in their skills or they got a new job that you're like, wow, how did they get that? I would love to do that. That is absolutely somebody that you should pursue. Yeah, this is great. Yeah. The one comment I want to add on mentorship is, you know, I get this question very very frequently just how do i get connected or find an organization like a stem organization that i can contribute to and they are i mean organizations are popping up everywhere to help kind of close the opportunity divide when it comes to education so comptia has launched several programs um you know year up which is the the picture on the slide they're a, a large and growing organization that takes um, high school graduates below the poverty line, uh, teaches them, um, you know, does a six month course uh, followed by six month internship and they, they pair people uh, with mentors. So this is one of those uh, questions that if you're interested, um, especially in the external mentorship opportunities, you know, post this question out on LinkedIn, you know, post it at an IBA event, here's what I'm interested in, who knows a local program that I could look at um, from a mentorship standpoint. Perfect. All right. We good? Is that closed? Good to move on? Perfect. Yep. 
Cool. So the last piece is around kind of community contributions. And this is another area kind of the, the buzzword for it is uh, CSR, corporate social responsibility. And a lot of companies are adding more things that they can do here, um, as well as um, individuals are thinking through more, what can I do to contribute to society and make a meaningful impact? Um, and Kate, I, on my screen, I'm still seeing the first poll. I'm not on the community slide. I don't know if, no, I don't know if we can bounce to that. Is that better? Yes, there we go. Sorry about so, that. Yep, odds are that folks are involved. You guys are involved in something within your you know, company or within your community. Um, you might be connected to a nonprofit now. You know, my biggest piece of advice when people come to me in this area uh, is just how can I, you know, do more? How can I find an opportunity? And my first question back to them is tell me about what you're involved in right now, right? Um, and, you know, it could be a local nonprofit, another organization. Um, again, if you have kids, it could be something uh, related to their school that you can be contributing to. But think about what am I involved in now or what am I passionate about? And then start with organizations that align and odds are an organization that you're passionate about could really benefit from somebody with your skills. Um, but seven times, your brand can be influenced up to seven times more favorably with giving back. And again, that's both internally at your organization as well as externally within your community. So, you know, if this is an area that you're like, wow, I've really been meaning to do something and I just haven't yet, I would think through and start to identify what programs, what give back or philanthropy or employee volunteerism programs exist within your company. And then what is IBA doing? And if your organizations that you're connected with aren't doing something, then launch something. Um, I'm going to give the Tampa IBA uh, community a quick shout out here because in the last year, they started park beautification projects. Yeah which is great branding, it's great for the environment, it's great networking and team building within the IABA community. It's something quick and easy that you can set up. So while, while it's, um, or whether it's using the skills that you already have or it's building new skills, there's always things you can do. Um, so mentioned early on in my bio, I run a Tech for Good group. I was part of the team that launched the Tech for Good group in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and then I was one of the organizers, and I am one of the organizers for the Tech for Good group in Tampa. Uh, that's a global network of 133 groups. So we have the link to share with you. But just like you're involved in an association like IAEA, there's community efforts like Tech for Good that bring together folks like yourself who are interested in helping nonprofits and have skills to offer that nonprofits simply can't afford. Um, to hire um, and, you know, the nonprofit community. So this is something that I'm so passionate about. It's probably resulted in the most um, number of interview requests and offers, as well as my biggest career uh, promotion with being able to kind of set up, give back events internally at APEC. And now I'm the philanthropy lead for the, the company because I started small. I started playing on in Baltimore that led to me getting selected for a national philanthropy committee, and then two, three years later, um, selected as the national philanthropy lead for the company. And I've gotten to do some wonderful things. Um, right now I'm working on uh, setting up a Gamers First Cancer e-games tournament for the American Cancer Society. So again, bottom line, so great for your brand, incredible for your network, helps you build skills, um, and it's great content for your resume LinkedIn profile when you're being considered for internal promotions or jobs. Anything here, Kate, that I missed that you think is important? No, I think this is great. Um, I mean, I think there are so many people out there that are looking for skills that you have and looking for help in those areas. So it's really just finding the right you know, the right community, um, the right group for you, but they are 100% out there and they need help and they so appreciate the help. So it's really nice to be able to give back and then again, gain some of those skills um, and experience that you might not have an opportunity to gain elsewhere. 
Yeah. And we had a quick poll here. We're curious just within, you know, what you've done in this area. So this will take five, 10 seconds if you guys could fill this out. But have you done this? And again, skills-based volunteering is you're, you're developing a new skill or expanding one that you don't have much exposure with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let me share the results of that. Oh, yes is 40%, no is 60%. So definitely an opportunity here. Okay, great. All right, we good? You guys can see, going to the next slide, social yep. media. Okay, good. And I know I want to make sure we have enough time um, for Nelkis to talk about her topic. So I'm going to breeze through social media a little bit. I mean, I think the slide speaks for itself, but a lot of people, including myself, have a love relationship with social media. Um, but it really can be a powerful tool for advancing your career and for your personal and professional branding. So think through how you are leveraging social media now. Are you simply using it for job searching? If the answer is yes, that's great. But I challenge you to explore one or more uses of social media. It's a great avenue for learning, again, branding, and for following thought leaders and influencers. I, I assume all of you follow IABA, which of course I do too. It's an amazing resource. Um, but you know, what other individuals and groups do you follow you know, for information and learning experiences? Eric and I both love Amy Cuddy. If you haven't watched her TED Talk on body language, highly recommend that one. And Erica actually turned me on to her newsletter. So think through some of those people that you admire. Do they have a website? Do they have a newsletter? Do you follow them on social media? Um, and also, this can be a great place to start when it comes to sharing content. You take somebody else's, you know, newsletter or an article that you saw, a little video, and you're saying, you, you give your summary as a new LinkedIn post. I mean, again, fantastic, easy place to start. Um, but there are really a lot of opportunities to leverage social media. So I just wanted to call those out here, um, you know, because there are really great are learning opportunities and most of it's free. Yeah, and Kate, I still, I'm not on the right slide, at least for me. I'm still in the community nonprofit contribution oh, slide. Social media, is that better? Yeah, and okay. you guys have access to this slide deck, okay. but again, and this would make a great follow-up conversation with folks from the local chapter on your team, just how do other people use social media for, for branding, for writing, for identifying trends, kind of turn this into a, a checklist, if you will but so many different ways. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is our summary slide. We kind of added this to the handout that you guys have, a one-page slide, but for all the programs we just talked about, you know, here's kind of our, our top 10. So, um, you know, you can definitely just print this slide or print that one-page handout. And we'd encourage you to kind of think through, what am I doing now? What am I involved with now? How could I expand on that and give back? Um, well, growing skills, branding, developing my network, et cetera. And that's kind of our last poll question, I believe, is just what are you, what are you guys going to do going forward? So really curious to see the results of this one. But, you know, what are you going to do to start growing your skills? And again, having a positive influence on your brand and growing that network to help future proof your career. Love it. Wow, this is great. 91%. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Perfect. All right. And I think we have one more slide um, before I turn it over. Um, and really, these are just our, our final thoughts. And you can see the slide, right? Annual Career Skills Assessment? Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> so there, we have an article here, this eight actions for your annual career audit. I highly recommend if you were somebody that selected this um, on your, you know, your annual career audit was something that you really want help with. A SWOT analysis is one of the greatest ways to guide your career mapping and development. 
So, you know, I laid out an example here. Um, again, it's going to be different for each individual, but this is a really fantastic reflection exercise. And then from here, you would build a training plan. You know, if you do get those skills, update your resume, update your LinkedIn profile. There's a whole step that you go through to, which we do outline in this audit. Um, but also, you know, have you done any of the skills and strengths tests? I know I did Strengths Finder. I think it's been, a, you know, a while now. That's another great thing to do, um, you know, to focus on, again, what are the things, what are my potential weaknesses or opportunities? Um, you know, how can I turn those into strengths, you know? And, and this is really, again, we recommend doing this at least once a year or twice a year, you know, if you are going to be somebody that's going to be transitioning into a new career or in and out of a, um, a job opportunity, um, this is a great, great exercise that we highly recommend to everybody. And we do outline how to do it in this um, tip down here. So with that, I'm going to turn it over um, to Danelle because I want to make sure she has enough time to cover her awesome resources that she's going to share today. Ladies, you did a phenomenal job. I'm sitting here with excitement. Every time you mention something, I'm like, oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, we could, we talked about this before the session. We could talk about this topic for three hours and not have enough time. So I'm going to try to keep it short so that we have some time for Q&A. Um, but as Kate was mentioning with the resources and being able to evaluate yourself and where you stand, and I love that you use SWOT as one of the techniques because as VAs, we're very familiar with that. Um, but one of the resources that we have, which targets specifically to BA skills, and, and I have found myself looking at it various times, is our career resource guide, um, our action guide. And what it does is it has a lot of them, and, and I, I've been a BA for, for almost 20 years, so it's really cool to sit there and look at, as a BA, these are some of the skills that I should have, and these are some of the techniques that I should be familiar with. And with our career action guide, you're able to actually read one-liners and say, hey, am I great at that or do I need some work on it? And it's pretty much a self-reflection. We're really good about telling everybody else how to find value and, and elevating all of our projects and all of our clients. But sometimes we forget to take care of ourselves. And I think today's presentation was phenomenal um, to remind us to stop and just reflect. And, we're our number one stakeholder. Like if we don't worry about ourselves and elevating ourselves and you know, who else will do this for us? So what this career action guide does is just that. And I found myself referring to it multiple times throughout my career. Um, it's pretty cool to see where you've gained knowledge and, and where you still need some work, like the little reminders. So take a look at it. We have it online. It's one of our member resources that I have found extremely valuable. And then once you go through that exercise, it helps you plan what your next moves are. It helps you visually see where you need some help. And then we have our interactive Babok and, and Agile extension online, where you could easily just search for the term, search for some additional um, resources that you could read up on it and, and learn, learn a little bit more um, about increasing your skills. Now, we're not in this alone. One of, our, one of the strengths that we have is you know, being able to work with with a variety of different stakeholders and a variety of, of levels of education. Who better than to lean on each other? Um, so one of the things that I did early in my career, or well, I wouldn't say early in my career, but I should have, I wish I would have done it earlier, was reach out to our local chapters. Now this was before I came on board as a staff member and being able to go to your local chapter and be in the same room or, or video conference with someone that has the same background, with someone that knows what our struggles are, um, like public speaking, which is not my forte at all whatsoever, as I sit here with anxiety as I go through this. Um, you could connect with, with others in your profession that you could bounce ideas off of. You could say, hey, I need to present this to my team. What does it sound like? It, it's a safe zone because we're all in it together. Um, so it's, it's easy for us to collaborate and share you know, if I've done this on one project, how, you know, how did you um, excel in this in this area? Um, so reaching out to your chapters, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in our next slide, and I just looked at the time, so I've got to talk a little faster. Um, one of the graphics that, that we have that I absolutely love showing is within our skills, once we know where we are with this career action guide and what our strengths and weaknesses are, we could apply it anywhere. 
I absolutely love this graphic. Mm -hmm. it, you have, I could tell you that I'm definitely business focused, not necessarily tech, um, technology focused. You could see where on the spoke you could excel or where you need some help. And at the end of the day, if you guys really think about it, do something that you're passionate about because regardless of what industry you decide to go into, VAs are needed. The, it's, it's a mindset that we have. There's no off button, whether we want to find it or not. It's just simply the way we think. Um, so this guide, this, this spoke, it helps us realize where we fit in within, within the world, within just different corporations. And one of the things that we have noticed in our research is a lot of VAs are specializing and, and the research helped us just exactly create this, this information and say, hey, if we're specializing in the world out there, then let's turn around and have some of our specialized um, certifications as well. So that's where we turned around a couple of years ago. We started with our Agile certification. We have the business data analytics. We just launched cybersecurity. So it's a way for us to say, yes, we're an awesome VA, but now we're specialized in a certain area. Um, and it helps us showcase our, our skills in, in areas that we're passionate. And like I was mentioning earlier with our chapters, we're not out there, we're not in this alone. And sometimes you could reach out to someone in the industry that either you want to learn about a certain area more and you know that they're in that profession or a chapter that, like the ladies were mentioning, you want to start interacting with, with your local chapters, you learn about beautifying parks and, and how you could take that to the next level and our applier skills. Um, our Ottawa chapter has been doing phenomenal things. They have been um, do, do VA hackathons where you could give back to your community. They have, I know one of the questions in the chat box that came in was, hey, what if I'm starting a new career? What if I'm getting into business analysis? Well, there's transferable skills um, to begin with. And the other part of it is your chapters are a great area for you to practice those leadership skills and it's in a safe zone we're all in this together like i mentioned so if it's something that you want to explore you could either find that mentor mentee relationship where you, either someone coaches you or you coach someone else to share that knowledge it's great for thought leadership as we were saying earlier and and being able to showcase with your community um, again your knowledge or again gain knowledge from from your peers so make sure you look out to, um, into um, your local chapters. Just again, help elevate yourself and help elevate those around you because it really does make a difference. Um, and speaking is not my thing. I, it's helped me through, through the local chapters as well as even doing little things like Erica was mentioning of, I now record my video newsletters just to become more comfortable with having my, my camera on. And it's again, it's a safe zone. We're all in this together. It's we're a global organization, but yet we're a close knit community. Um, and we really do push each other to, to the next level. So reach out to your local chapter. Um, feel free to always reach out to us as well. Kate and Erica have left their contact information as well and some of their um, contact information. I think the most important message that, that I could recap is we're not in this alone, collaborate with each other and take that risk. If you don't watch out for yourself, um, there's someone along the way that will help you and push you along the way and, and give you that honest feedback um, to make you a better person and, and make you succeed in, in, in our career and, and our, have passion in what we do. I know we're at the top of the hour and, and I try to speak as much as I can, um, as quickly as I can, so we're not gonna have much time for our Q&A. But I do want to let everyone on the line know that the questions that did come in, we will respond to you via email. Um, I'll sh share the information with Kate and Erica as well. So you'll hear back from one of us. And I really want to thank everyone for your time. Like I said, we could talk about this for hours. Yes. Um, but this is a start. This is a starting point, And we're always available um, to follow up with you if needed. Kate and Erica a wealth of information you shared with us today. Thank you very much for an amazing presentation. Thank you, everyone.
Thanks, everybody. So with that, I will sign off for today. Thank you, Kate, Erica, and Janelkis for some great presentations and amazing points. It sounds like everybody here has learned a lot just looking at the questions coming in. And thank you to our audience for joining us today, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. See you around.